till this morning. They observing, witnessing the way it is. <coughs> the state of mind you're in, the just to take an interest in being the observer, the witness, the knowing, <coughs> the knowing. In uh, emotional qualities, mental states, that uh, these are, of course, arise through conditions, you know, so the state of your health, uh, can even the, the time of the month, the uh, whether it's morning or evening, noon, full moon or no moon, uh, Springtime, whatever. <coughs> the mood is, uh, of any of us, is, is changeable according to the conditions that we're experiencing. So the, the, the puto, or the knowing of this, is, is transcending the, the mood. We can observe, you know, we can witness too the state of mind, the mood of conscious experience at this time as an object. And so this, this sense of recognizing this subject-object relationship of uh, knowing from the puto position rather than from the sense of my feelings and my mood, the self-view. And so the self-view is always very much you know, how we generally experience life is, I feel like this, and the identity with with the particular mental state that we're experiencing, or just reacting to it. And there's so many patterns of resistance or uh, rejection of mental states, or not, not looking, not observing, but merely uh, bypassing it. trying to do something, get something out of some idea of attainment or what should be done. So even this, you know, the observing this, the feeling that there's something to do, something I've, I've got to do, I've got to get or get rid of, that can be observed, that can be a, an object. In Pali, uh, Aramana is the is the word for that the, the object. So then the most people don't differentiate subject and object. We all align it with with uh, uh, the ego is very much based on on uh, claiming on habit patterns on identity on attachment. So the only way out of that, to free ourselves from that, is through the awareness of it. So this listening or attentiveness, alertness, sati sampachanya, is the kind of essence, is the, the real heart of Buddhist teaching. Um, a lot of mental states, as I've said before, are not clearly definable. And, but they can be vague, confused, uh, just feeling of insecurity or lack. It can be relatively unnoticeable unless we pay attention. Not to, and, and, and again I emphasize it's not to define or label them, but to just trust 
exist in the awareness it's the way it is. So at this moment, uh, there's the mood. And you can be aware of the, the body, your physical body. It's what does it feel like as experience here and now? breath, <coughs> the sound of silence, all these are present here and now. And this uh, awareness then allows us to <coughs> just notice them, witness to them. They are the way they are. You know that you're, you're no longer seeking to, to judge them or analyze them or claim them, but just recognition. And this uh, awareness then is uh, is the uh, another way of of reflecting is using uh, metta practice, metta pavana, which is uh, loving kindness, or the loving kindness is acceptance of the way it is, or the object, uh, whether it's uh, you know another person or. <coughs> a situation or a mental state, whether it's uh, you're inside you or outside, metta is our ability to, you know, accept unconditionally <coughs> the way it is. And so oftentimes metta is is uh, identified with <coughs> external situation. <coughs> metta for other people for, or we say, start with ourselves, metta for oneself, for may I abide in well-being, may all beings be happy, and so forth. This is a, a formula. But when you get to the very heart of metta practice, it, it's, uh, you know, the beings then, whether they're near or far, or they're human or animal or, or uh, possible beings or, you know, imagined beings or mental states, moods of the mind, uh, the body itself. Metta then is, uh, is, is the skillful means of receiving and allowing anything to be what it is. It doesn't mean approving and liking everything in as an not ma trying to say we should love in the sense of liking every mental state we have or every human being we meet, but this unconditioned it means accepting, allowing the present moment, whatever way you're experiencing it, to be what it is. Yeah, so this is mean we don't have to do anything about it. We don't have to, uh, you know, judge it or get rid of it or, or um, attach to it, but recognize. So having metta for oneself, may I abide in well-being, and then is, is a, a simple ability we have to witness to to the beings that we're experiencing now. And as you notice that the the Buddha talks about sape sankarani cha, all conditions, all sankharas, and that includes your mental states, uh, your physical body, your uh, thoughts, opinions, views, the uh, internal 
conditions, subtle, coarse, and external, what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. So metta as an ideal uh, can be, you know, is a beautiful ideal in itself, unconditioned love. And uh, it's the kind of way we'd like to be, have this, this heart full of metta. But then in terms of the realities of this, this present moment, the anger or resentment or doubt or whatever one is feeling, that's also a being also, in, you know, it is a condition, it's sankhara. <coughs> the metta isn't particularly, you know, it ain't only human beings or, or sentient beings that have physical forms, but it includes all forms, where, you know, all sankharas, mental, physical, emotional, And then um, with this uh, practice of metta, <coughs> it, 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 it really, uh, its essence is mindfulness. Because <coughs> in, in the awareness, then we, we, uh, we're not judging. It's not a judgmental factor in, in our experience. It's not saying how things should be or shouldn't be, but it's recognizing the way it is, because at this moment it can only be this way. For each one of us, whatever, how you're feeling physically or mentally or whatever, uh, good, bad, indifferent, you know, to want it to be other than that is, uh, is making a problem about it. Even a, like a bad mood, uh, one is in a very negative state uh, at this moment. It's you know, it's as I say, you shouldn't feel like that. <coughs> is uh, you know, this is making this a judgment, isn't it? The, the state of the bad mood you're in, you shouldn't you shouldn't have this mood. You should try to get rid of it. Is coming from the uh, Ignorance of the mind. Because at this moment it could only be this way. You know, it is the way it is. And uh, just uh, thinking of this, you know, how could it be otherwise? You know, how could you, you know, to make demands on the world to be other than it is at this moment is... is uh, Asking for the impossible. Because at this moment, uh, the, the, what we're witnessing and observing is the way it is. This is an honest statement. It's, uh, it's, there's alertness, attention. There's wisdom. Metta, loving kindness. Or acceptance, uh, put it, taking the word metta in, out of the context of loving kindness, of just acceptance, unconditional acceptance. Then the this way of training yourself to to be to trust in this in this in imminent ability we all have of paying attention to the present, being here and now. And, you know, that's the, as I said before, there's time is an illusion. There's only here and now. Experience is always now.
So as meta as an ideal, then we try to do things uh, to make ourselves fit the ideal, you know, try to, you know, live up to an ideal of unconditioned love or loving kindness. Uh, but it's coming from attachment to the ideal of metta. So what is the reality of metta right now? It's if, uh, you know, it's what is unconditioned love right now in terms of, of your witnessing, your conscious experience of this moment. And then you might feel very angry or upset with somebody or something and, and uh, think, well, I don't have any meta right now. It's a, I'm just too upset because those people, they shouldn't have done what, they shouldn't have said what they said. And, and we, we get caught into the uh, attachment to the mood or to be able to transcend the mood just through awareness of it. And this is also metta, isn't it? It's not transcending the mood to get rid of it. We think if, if we idealize transcending as a, as a kind of weapon to get rid of what we don't like, then we've, we've caught in delusion again. So this is where it's an, an unspoken, imminent awareness Pure subjectivity, Bhutto, the Buddha knowing the Dhamma. So, in emotions like like fear or panic or uh, just anxiety, worry. They, uh, in meditation, of course, these, when the condition, when the conditions are there for these emotions to become conscious, then they, then they are that way. They are what they are. And the, the reality of fear then is. Uh, Fear is a kind of primal uh, emotion. It's you know a, we live in a realm of that's where fear is uh, everywhere. This is a fear-ridden realm we're living in. Just the like the animal world that we see around us. It's it's uh, it lives in in fear. You know, being survival, survival of the fittest. So fear is, is a, a kind of, you know, it's not, it can be, we call it neurotic or, uh, because we think we shouldn't have fear, we shouldn't be afraid as an ideal, but fear is part of, you know, the reality of this uh, realm that we're living in, the conditioned realm, which is changing, fear of death, fear of loss. Fear of the unknown. Mm. And as long as we're identified with the death-bound conditions, with the sankharas, then our life is very much uh, influenced by that emotion, fear, because uh, how could it be otherwise? Whatever we have, whatever we're attached to, whatever, no matter how secure we might feel in the present, we know it's going to change. Loss, uh, uh, fear of the future, fear of the Armageddon, fear of nuclear holocaust, fear of uh, next earthquake, tsunami, uh, a meteorite crashing into the earth. There's so many possibilities of misery and pain uh, in this realm that we're, you know, that we're incarnated into. <coughs> So many unknown factors in the, the universe itself is a is such a mystery. 
and that potential of, uh, you know, coming from outer space, aliens from outer space, or meteorites, or comets. Anything could happen. Terrorism, nuclear war, epidemics. There's always the, these rumors, you know, ever since I can remember, there's always been this, this kind of fear uh, in, in the society that I've lived in. Because uh, even though we, we would like to establish a society or a s where we don't have this fear that we can really trust and count on and you know, through our whole life, this is another ideal. But just recognizing uh, having a human body, a sensitive form, conscious, that's in a universe that is very vast, mysterious, with so many unknown factors in influencing every moment of our conscious life. Now, is it the stars, the alignment of the planets, or the sun and the moon, or the 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 forces out there, the uh, the Deva Loka, the, the Brahma Loka, the Asura Loka, the Preta Loka. I mean, these are all ways, uh, words, concepts that we form around the, uh, all the unknown, infinite possibilities of pleasure and pain that we can imagine you know, within this, uh, contained within this uh, physical body this conscious moment. So you read, you know, so much of the literature of the previous century around the nature of existence and uh, various religions attempt to try to explain it and give a sense of security by, uh, you know, putting your faith in in uh, some religious doctrine, some teaching. <coughs> so, that, like in Buddhist meditation, we're getting to the very source of this, where fear arises. In terms of uh, you know our own direct experience of it, not uh, some kind of grand macrocosmic source, but. Uh, this this condition here that we call my body myself this is this is what we can actually learn from so the unknown isn't it to can be very frightening the dark the the possibilities uh, that we can imagine that we can't can't see directly like ghosts spirits, um, aliens from outer space, uh, all these, these kind of symbols that they make films about, ex exciting uh, horror films and whatnot about the, uh, you know, the unknown, the strange, the unexpected, the unseen that can really cause us harm or misery of some sort or loss. Now that of course is, you know, the thinking process. What, you know, we create, we have, we can imagine all kinds of possibilities, fantasy, uh, we can fantasize Imagine all kinds of things happening. But to bring attention to the here and now, then, just this, this imminent attentiveness to the present, this is actually the, the path or the way out of that fear. The way not to get rid of fear, but to put fear in the perspective of a, a Ramana, for what it is. 
and it is what it is, it's like this. And in that way of loving kindness and metta is, is receiving that the way it is, opening to it, not to let it, you know, not the idea of if you open to it, it takes you over. There's always this fear of some evil force, some uh, unknown alien force can take you over and make you into something, you know, make you do things or become some demonic creature. But that fear, that kind of thing, is only possible through ignorance. You know, that as long as ignorance is the is the uh, position we take on on life, then of course we can. You know, it's possible to become anything, become a demon or whatever, through ignorance, not through awareness. So the Buddha's uh, encouragement to awaken, wake up, pay attention, observe the way it is. This is a, you know, a wonderful, kind of marvelous uh, and compassionate teaching to, to encourage us to do something that we actually can do, you know, not trying to become a Buddha or some something else, but just within the limitation of the five khandhas that we experience, that awareness is the liberation itself. Now, metta then is, you know, the non judgmental, um, way we can open and receive life. Uh, as long as there's conditions, you know, I won't only really accept things, uh, if they, you know, well, if I agree with it or like it or approve. And this it comes from the ego, the fear-ridden ego, isn't it? Where I, you know, I have to really control a situation. I have to, <coughs> you know, resist the evil forces and or destroy them. I have to. Uh, my life is an endless battle. It's in this kind of, kind of dualistic level, what they call Manichaeism, the idea of this uh, eternal battle between the good and the bad. <coughs> and of course, that is uh, that. That's the result of attachment to, out of ignorance to the ideals of good and bad. You know, the endless fighting, trying to control, destroy the axis of evil. Eliminate the pests, and this, the mind is, is very much conditioned to to think in this way. This dualistic pattern. It's logical, isn't it? In, in order to sustain the good, you've got to get rid of the bad. <coughs> if God is good, then anything that's not good, we should get rid of. It uh, certainly makes sense, doesn't it? And on that level of uh, 
of uh, thought and concept. And so <coughs> this thinking itself then is put in this perspective of an aramana. Thought is, is an arom, is an aramana. Uh, and to let go of thought, not to, no longer to let thought be self, to create yourself endlessly with concepts and memories, but to be the awareness of thought. And then thought, of course, is dualistic. So, it, you know, when you think good, it, it immediately brings up bad, you know, because they're a pair. They go together, one extreme with the other. <coughs> the the uh, shoulds and shouldn'ts, the prescriptions, you know, of what should be and what shouldn't be. <coughs> So on that level of, of dualism, of thought, then we, you know, we all know what should be and what shouldn't. We should love each other. We should have compassion. We should be kind. Uh, we should have fairness and justice, mercy. We should have peace. And the ideal, of, you know, of equality and freedom for everybody. We should treasure the earth and take care of it, be guardian to protect the, the environment, not just exploit it. We shouldn't be selfish. We shouldn't hate people, we should love them. And the, this, is, this is what thinking is all about, isn't it? Of should and shouldn't. You have the best and the worst. So at this moment, what is it that isn't a thought, that isn't, uh, you know, you're not thinking, but just you know, there's consciousness and there's attention. And so that I, you know, recognize through just this awareness Recognizing this awareness is like this. So that the conscious experience is not attached to any particular thing. I'm not trying to be aware of anything in particular. You know, I've not got an agenda or a, some kind of thing I'm trying to, to pay attention to, but just learning to recognize a natural state of attentiveness poised attention, openness, that it is metta. You know, because uh, awareness then, not attached to anything, conscious, the conscious reality of this moment, then it, there's not attachment. So that what does become conscious is seen in terms of Dhamma. It's, it's received in that way. And the nature of all conditions is arising and ceasing. So, so it's not a matter of me trying to get rid of bad thoughts because uh, I shouldn't have them, but recognizing it's bad, a bad mood or bad thoughts or bad memories are like this. By the our fear, anxiety and worry about the future is like this, then I'm allowing these these beings, these conditions to be what they are, and their nature of course is anicca, arising, ceasing. So trusting in that, you know, that insight is very powerful so that you, there's nothing to do anymore. You know, it's not a matter of making yourself pure, trying to get rid of your faults and become a saint, but to just trust in this simple, imminent awareness in the present.
know, somebody was asking me about how to deal with fear the other day, and fear is a, is a, you know, very powerful emotional state that we experience, and and it and the fear, of course, has tremendous power if, you know, by making us run away, isn't it? Is when we feel frightened, the immediate reaction is to run away or get rid of it. It's very, you know, very strong. I was in the early life as a monk, you know, I remember really confronting fear as I living at Tham Sang Pet, uh, the first year at Tham Sang Pet in Am Nat Teller, and I was, I was living in this, they built, this was a, before the rainy season, so the villagers built a kind of platform in this cave. And then there was this, and, and it was, you know, uh, raised above the ground, and there was, you know, there's uh, a python living in the cave also. So then there were bats. And... Uh, so I was in a place where, quite unprotected, living on this platform, didn't have any sides, didn't have a roof or anything, just a platform in this kind of grotto, rock grotto. And at night, and when there weren't any, when the say when the there wasn't moonlight or anything, it was so pitch black. And you sit on this platform, looking at the blackness all around. And then there'd be some animal moving, you know, there's an owl that makes some kind of weird noise, or, and you could imagine the python kind of winding its way up onto the platform and swallowing me. Or then ghosts, any possibility about ghosts, you know, how many spirits or unknown forces in that blackness. And just but sitting there, looking out at that blackness, and it seemed so vast, you know, where did it end? You know, just you know, when, you're, when you're looking, you know, your eye, uh, my eyes were open, looking at this black infinity in front of me. There was no, you know, couldn't see an end to it. It just seemed to go on and on, and any possibility, anything I could think of. And out of that blackness, I wasn't, the tendency wasn't to create like out there guardian angels and radiant beings protecting me uh, in that blackness. The, the mind tended to move into the more negative states, like you know, thinking about the the spirit, the dark spirits, the demons, the ghosts, the possibility of all kinds of horrible, dark, dangerous, and menacing creatures that that one can imagine in that dark surround and little old me, you know, with sitting there on this platform just waiting to be taken over or eaten by some something, a wild animal or whatever. <coughs> so then in the Tudonga tradition you have these uh, Umbrellas you make, you know, with a mosquito net around them. So I'd, I'd sit out on this dark platform and and get scared, just thinking about what's out there in the dark. And I'd go in the inside this mosquito net and light a candle, you know. So then the the candle light would light up the, the area within the mosquito net, which wasn't very big at all. No bigger than that cushion I, I sit on. And, uh, and yet uh, I didn't feel so frightened after that because I could see around me, you know. If there was any demonic forces, wild animals, or tigers waiting to eat me, or the python, it was, that mosquito net would have not been any kind of protection whatsoever. <laughs> You know, but the sense of seeing, you know, uh, yeah, the candle light and, and the contained space. It wasn't this infinite blackness out there. It was contained, light contained within a, a circle that uh, would make me feel much more secure. 
the mind wouldn't go into these wild fantasies because uh, I could actually see what was around me. The immediate space around me was, there weren't any, there wasn't any dangerous creatures there. So that's the, oftentimes what we, we, how we live our lives, isn't it? In, the, in this delusion of, of, you know, still the dangers are ever present, but we live in a way that, that we, we don't have to feel at so much. We have the illusion of safety. We have the candle, the candle flame in the mosquito net that gives this sense of, I know what's around me. It's okay, I'm all right. But when you look at the universe, you know, on a at nighttime, the stars and the, you know, it is. It's possibilities, the probabilities. You know, the planet we live on is such an unstable, uncertain thing, isn't it? And the tsunamis and, and earthquakes, things like that, catastrophes happen, and we s we're shocked. How could our solid earth, you know, wha where can we go that we can really trust that we'll be safe? Because all these plates that shift, you know, that we, we have no control over them, how we can control the, 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 this planet so that we'll feel safe in it all the time. But we like the illusion of safety. You know, create the illusion that everything's going to be all right. <coughs> so then, because of the meditation, I could really observe this sphere. You know, start just instead of just being caught up in the fantasies that I could create, the demonic fantasies and the possibilities for all kinds of horrible things happening in the dark, if I just was aware of this, this, this feeling, it's quite palpable fear, you know, it's not, a, not something very subtle, so one can actually observe it, open to it, and that openness is, is, a, is a meta practice, isn't it? Opening, allowing fear, the, the presence of fear, with loving kindness or acceptance. Now that's going against the whole reactive pattern of our human state, isn't it? It's a, you fear usually its power lies in deluding us. It, you know, I have power over you. If I can, if I can frighten you, make you af af afraid of me, then I've got a lot of power over you. <coughs> so I come on really strong and fierce, and you, and you, and I make you uh, frightened of me. Actually, have power. You've given me the power. to control you through fear. And that's how tyrannies work, isn't it? And, and is to, you know, like secret police uh, organizations and, and uh, Gestapos and things like that. They, you have to run a country, as, you know, if you're a tyrant, you have to make everybody frightened to control them because you've got, you can really terrify, like Saddam Hussein in Iraq certainly, you know, could sustain his his tyranny through terror, through making everybody frightened of, of, you know, criticizing or doing anything against his wishes. So he had control, he had, and the Iraqi people empowered him with that. So we're all participating in, the, in this game, you know, it's not just one way. So if we don't understand fear, then then we are. We can easily be manipulated and controlled by others, by governments or dictators or partners or whatever. <coughs> so 
then the recognizing this fear, the metta practice then is is receiving. Fear is like this. You know, the the when we spread metta and and we share the merit of our practice, it's with, with all the forces in the universe, the Lord of death, the good, the bad, the high, the low. Uh, it, it's not, it's not uh, just sharing the goodness of our life, the blessings of our life with only the, the good forces in the universe, but it's with the negative ones also. So this is like, like metta is non-critical doesn't place conditions. You know, like condition love is, I love you if you obey me. If you live up to my principles and standards, behave yourself accordingly, conduct yourself in the way that I approve of, uh, and then I love you. But the minute you don't, there's no love anymore. And that's another kind of, uh, you know, threat, isn't it? It's threatening everything. You know, you you have to please me in order to receive my love, my approval. Well, that's conditioned, isn't it? That's that's not love in in sense of metta. That's uh, you know, that's kilesa. <coughs> So unconditioned love then, or metta, isn't, isn't, uh, doesn't demand approval. It's not approving of anything. Or liking, doesn't imply liking, but allowing things to be what they are. So that, because our relationship to the conditioned realm is, is witnessing it, recognizing it, and no longer attaching to it, identifying, being lost in the power of of, uh, of the kalesas. So I, when I was at Tamsang Pet, then I, I noticed that learning to to just trust in this awareness in the dark. that even if I put the candle outside the mosquito net, sit outside the mosquito net with candlelight, I notice that when the candlelight shines in the dark, in the vast space, then it makes even weirder kind of shadows, creepy kind of eeriness in this, in this rock grotto. You sit out on the platform outside the mosquito net with the candle, and then the flickering candle would all kinds of shadows would move in eerie forms. I mean, e- imagination could easily create all kinds of weird uh, possibilities of of ghosts and demons through the, the through the uh, eeriness of the of the light of the candle flame when it when it's not contained within the the uh, mosquito net. Then there was one owl that used to stare at me. Which is another, you know, one could easily project onto that owl some kinds of evil intentions. Never did anything, never harmed me in the least. But um, when I, you know, you're testing this out, when I open to this darkness, this eeriness, this, uh, this fear, with loving kindness. And this way I mean it's like, like trusting in this awareness. Just this simple attentiveness to where the fear was, could be seen as an object. But not to get rid of it, not to get rid of the fear because I don't want it, but to just receive fear. Fear is this way. It is the way it is. And then you're actually 
you know, allowing things to be what they are, and they arise and cease according to their nature. That's the way all conditions are. They, some, you know, the the movements, and some disappear immediately, and others take time. Things like that. So, it's not a matter of, of, uh, you know, short or long, short time or long time, or instant or gradual, but allowing, you know, whatever it to to be what it is, it's fulfill its calm, in other words, from beginning to end or birth to death. And by trusting in that awareness, then the, the fear, you know, would, would drop away because there's, it's not, I'm not feeding it. So it always reminded me of, you know, like, like uh, these stories of dragons that, you know, they're they're really, you know, full of air. They're nothing much, but they have the appearance of being ferocious and dangerous. And then, as you turn around them and receive them with loving kindness, they shrivel up. There's nothing in them, but they. They have a power to chase you your whole life if you if you just keep running and so suddenly the dragon comes and goes boo and you run away then it's that empty uh, thing called a dragon is uh, can keep chasing you uh, for your whole life and you'll keep running until you stop running and you're not killing the dragon you're not trying to to, you know, to stab it, but just disempower it. No longer, you know, empowering it with, with your fear, but by recognizing it, receiving it with loving kindness, then it, its nature is to, it, it, is, it no longer has the, the ability to frighten you, so it, it uh, shrivels up, disappears. And it's not trying to kill it either, isn't it? It's not, it's not malevolent trying to kill off the dragon, but to receive it with loving kindness. So this, this uh, awareness, metta practice, they, they align themselves really in this perfect way. Uh, on the c- dealing with conditioned phenomena, isn't it? Metta has no critical function. So that's why metta is for the, the angels, the devils, the lord of death, the, the, the good, bad, everything. Uh, all, con- all possibilities, all variations, permutations on conditioned phenomena, coarse, subtle, refined, gross, good, bad, indifferent, Wonderful, horrible, uh, all uh, all conditioned phenomena then is uh, you know is is accepted for what it is, and then that then it fulfills its its role. It lives its span. And so, in this way, when we when we d- develop this this metta practice, awareness, align the awareness. Now, so we don't idealize metta into some kind of, of uh, high emotional state of feeling good about everything, but bringing it down to, to much more practical reality where, where we can actually use in the midst of uh, when, when we are frightened, when there is when we are being abused or treated badly by others or life is not being fair to us and you know we've got every reason on personal level to be angry and upset and and uh, frightened <coughs> but then the awareness is the gate to liberate ourselves from being caught and bound into that limitation And it's not an annihilation of the conditions, is it? It's a, it's receiving condition 
phenomena in terms of the Buddha and Dhamma, the, the wise reflection on the way it is. So this word Dhamma is, is uh, recognized, it's uh, the, the conditions are Dhamma and the unconditioned. The created and the uncreated. So in the uncreated then, one can't create the uncreated. I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> so if, you know, if you create an idea about the uncreated, then you're attached to another idea. There's, there's something called the uncreated, and I believe in the uncreated, or... I mean, the Buddha says, it talks about the deathless and the uncreated. I um, don't know what that is, but uh, I believe in it. It's not, you know, that's, that's still the created, isn't it? You're still operating from the created. So reflect, you know, what at this moment isn't created? In terms of your experience here and now, And so this uh, awareness then, sati sampajanya, you know, I'm not creating it. Well, I can create a, a kind of tranquil mental, emotional state by closing my eyes and concentrating on a, on a refined subject, a refined object to, to absorb into. I can create a a refined conscious experience through controlling the conditions that I'm experiencing at this time. <coughs> but then as, uh, you know, as soon as the, the uh, eyes open or things change, then the, the tranquil state is gone. You know, so it's very dependent on, on control, you know, to, to live a a, a refined life, uh, a life just with beauty and 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 all the best. It means you have to exert a lot of control to sustain that for a very long. <coughs> and you have to, you know, live in pretty much uh, by avoiding and not looking, not noticing a lot most of what's around you. <laughs> to live in the in the mosquito net with the candlelight. You know, the contained space where you, you can see everything and everything's fine because everything you see is, is okay and no, no threat. <coughs> but out there, once you get out there, outside the mosquito net, who knows what's, what's lying in wait, what possibilities of, of loss and pain and misery might be. So it's better to, to live in this controlled state that you can, you know, you have got control over it, and you've got, you know, you can just stay in the mosquito net with the candle burning and feel safe. Or go outside the mosquito net and look at the fear, the unknown, the blackness everywhere, the infinite, seemingly infinite blackness goes on and on. And also recognizing that the that the insight also, you know, just through visual consciousness, looking at, at blackness, you know, then the emotions react, what's out there, what could be out there? I heard a strange noise, and there's that strange sound over there, and that weird-looking owl up there in the trees looking at, what does it want? You know, is it, is it a spirit of some sort? And what if that python comes? You know, pythons and they have big snakes. They can kill me. And, and there's rumors that there's a tiger and uh, who knows what, kind of all kinds of insects and scorpions and 
than ghosts. Rumors about somebody being murdered at Tum Sangpat. There's probably a ghost here, some evil demon. Uh, there's always rumors of some horrible thing happening. <coughs> Or going outside the mosquito net and, and looking at the fear and at the blackness. And what is it that can see the blackness? You know, what is consciousness but light itself, isn't it? That which sees uh, the darkness is a, through the eyes, sitting out on the platform, Tom Sangpet, no moon, no light, just blackness. And yet, I'm looking at blackness. And that very, bringing that attention to consciousness. You know, the, that's the, the light of consciousness that can see the blackness. So in this way, the, the <coughs> you know, you're resting in this, in this, in this awareness the light of awareness rather than uh, in the objects that, you're <coughs> that you might create in your mind or experience through your senses. Just reacting to them, to their beauty or frightening uh, possibilities. So this is like, a re what I'm doing is a reflection, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's sitting in the mosquito net. And this kind of false security, I mean, something's all right, you know, I don't feel frightened when I'm in this. And then if I think, well, what's outside there? And then I start projecting outside the mosquito, and I could become frightened again. Because outside the mosquito net is, you know, is vast. The mosquito net isn't very big. Candle flame isn't very much light. <coughs> so then the, uh, but then the awareness, that's not dark. It's like switching on the light, isn't it, of... of uh, being attentive and alert, even when the the even in the middle of night. Being attentive and alert in the middle of fear, anxiety, worry, uh, when the world around you is falling apart, when all your friends leave you and desert you, when you're put into a dungeon, chained to the wall, what. <laughs> <laughs> there's still this escape from suffering through awareness. So it's like exploring experience, you know, that in Vipassana meditation is really an investigation. It's ma uh, Yoniso Manasikara. In the, in the, you know, in Pali, they've got all these words that convey this sense of looking into, inside, vipassana itself means looking into the nature, looking deeply into it, not just, just you know, labeling things and, and, and then uh, not going any further than the surface or the, the kind of superficial labels that we project onto experience. So you can see it's not an intellectual endeavor just to to name everything in sight and and uh, and and use logic and reason, but it's it's from a diff uh, this this level of intelligence where panya operates, wisdom, developing the wisdom faculty to see things the way they are, to to know in the know for yourself. Bajitang Wei Tida Po Inuhi. 
to know for, through your own insight, not through what somebody else tells you. Or not knowing about something through reading or just operating from uh, views and uh, judgments that we acquire from, from outside. So in in the you know during this retreat you know what what really challenges you during this time you know maybe you know it can be fear or doubt or but see it always this is something to really learn from disillusionment uh, despair doubt. Uh, These are part of, these are developing the path. Everything is the path. You know, people give up the path because they become disillusioned or despairing or doubtful about themselves or about the tradition or whatever. But these are always opportunities. Or people fall in love somebody else and then the, that's the, the reason for me because that's a, another opportunity to see the, you know to get beyond the, the, the conditioned uh, phenomena that one is easily uh, dazzled by or uh, or reacting to So it really takes like determination to, to uh, you know, this is a strong determination because we're all going to be, we've all challenged a lot, you know, in, in all kinds of ways uh, because of our karma, you know, different things arising, different things changing, disappointment in monastic life. You don't know how much I've di been disappointed personally. You know, when you see your fellow monks and nuns give up and disrobe and things like this, you feel incredibly disappointed. But that's also part of the path, isn't it? not to get lost in disappointment or to you know to when when the people that you you know you feel this monastic bond with decide they they want to go somewhere else get out of it or do something else but that's also you know the path I mean, this is everything is is part of it belongs you know everything belongs so whatever you're experiencing you know a faith and inspiration and motivation and so forth uh, the the good side or the desperation the disillusionment the doubt and despair it's uh, you know this this is all conditioned phenomena Falling in love is conditioned phenomena. You know, it's uh, it, you know not to dismiss it as as, as an, you know and, and put it down, but it is you know you, falling in love is not ultimate reality. <coughs> And it changes, you know, you fall in and you fall out. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, this is, uh, you know, just recognizing this, the, the, in terms of Dhamma, then, it becomes Dhamma, what, 
What begins ends. What comes together separates. So the refuge then is, is not in, in trying to create a, uh, a monastery where all the monks and nuns are determined, dedicated, really ideal monks and nuns, you know, that, that with strong determination have all the best qualities to have the perfect monastery. I've given up on that one. <laughs> But uh, to use the monastery you're in for awareness. So, you know, this is, you know, Amaravati is like this. You know, so I'm not saying it's the best or it's the way all monasteries should be or just to spend time picking it apart and thinking, well, it could be better or should be or shouldn't be. But to use the, the, uh, this, the opportunity here, the encouragement, is not to, to uh, you know, we're not forming a cult of devotees uh, with a party line, but trying to give opportunity and occasion to really reflect and observe, develop, the cultivate the bhavana, this eightfold path, this way of liberation. And uh, to do this, you don't need to have, you know, the perfect place with the perfect teacher and the perfect sangha and the perfect this, because there isn't any. And I've never found one perfect Buddhist monastery. Even Wat Ba Pong with Ajahn Chah, I could find plenty of faults with that monastery. <laughs> and uh, wherever, I mean, I'm good at, I'm a quite critical person, so I'm very good at finding fault with me, with you, with every place. So the perfection isn't the point, isn't it? It's the, it's the uh, willingness to use the situation with attention, awareness, cultivating, a, or with this, this word, bhavana, <coughs> Though even at times of great despair, you know, feelings of failure and despair, these are, you learn a lot from that. You know, these are very valuable. And I look back in, in monastic, in my monastic past, of, of the, the amount of despair and disappointment, and yet. That's also because the willingness to use that, to, to, to learn from despair, from disillusionment, from disappointment, means that, you know, I'm, I'm willing to allow this, this emotion to be what it is. And it is, you know, it, Certainly not permanent, I guarantee it. <laughs> uh, I don't feel despair anymore. So, so it's, uh, but it's not because I'm suppressing, you know, I just don't, I'm living in my, my mosquito net with my candle flame and just trying to be, everything's all right, isn't it? <laughs> all around me, everything's okay. And then, Please tell me everything is okay. I used to be like that. Just tell me everything is okay. Don't tell me the truth. Because I like the delusions. When Ajahn Chah, when he was really very, very sick, and he'd gone to, a, they had a special kuti to take care of him. And you'd go there and you'd see Ajahn Chah lying there helpless and... <coughs> be rather depressing and and then you I'd go over to his old kuti in the main part of the monastery and there was this uh, wax effigy of Lung Pa Cha sitting on the seat you know with his holding his stick like this 
they they look and they they make these effigies very lifelike, you know. They look look like Lung Po Cha sitting there. And I remember sitting at the feet, bowing to this effigy of Lung Po Cha, this plastic model, and thinking to myself, I think I prefer this plastic model. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel bad to sit in front of the plastic model and the, then to go back into the into the kuti and uh, and see the reality. <laughs> and so, how many you know how many human beings live with with the plastic models of life and the illusions? Or just tell me everything is okay. Is everything okay? Yes, Ajahn Sumaila, everything's okay. You sure now? Yes, everything's fine. You sure? Yeah, everything's okay. No problem. <laughs> I feel okay. <laughs> I feel okay if everything's okay. Even if it's not okay, tell me it's okay. Then I'm okay. <laughs> or when, when life does get difficult, you know, I mean, it's not okay and everything's falling. What's that like? What's it like when, when, when you lose, when, you, when you've lost, when the people you, you depended on and became bonded with leave and, and there's disappointment, there's blame, people and spread rumors and, and there's all kinds of criticisms and blame and, and you think, oh, the whole thing's falling apart, I'm a failure. And then the awareness of that, of failure, of despair, of loss, is this way. That open, that's opening with metta to this mental state. You know, that's very strengthening, because if you can endure through that, you can endure through anything. Because it, it can be very, you know, it, one could easily, you know, if one didn't have a way out, one, you could really get depressed. You know, when you get sunk into depression, it's hard to get out of it if you're totally committed to that reality. But if you trust the awareness, then you, you find increasing confidence and strength in the path, the Eightfold Path. 